and unit two. Here we go. All right, unit two starts with chapter four, the Trinity. Know the doctrine of the Trinity by being able to define person and substance. So the idea there is that God is one God or one divine substance, but three distinct persons, the person of the Father, the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit are all the same God and therefore share that same divine substance. So one substance, three persons, one God, three persons. Um, whenever you're talking about the threeness of God, always use the word persons. All right, know what a paradox is. Know the two paradoxical statements of the Trinity. All right, so a paradox is where two statements seem to be in conflict as far as our human reason goes, um, but they're not because they're both true in reality. So it's not a contradiction. It's a seeming contradiction according to our human reason, but both are true in reality. And the paradoxical statements of the Trinity is that there is only one God and also three persons are that one and same God. So only one God and three persons are that one and same God. If it was a contradiction, it would be something like there's only one God, also there's not only one God. Well, they, that can't be true. Or there, there are three persons that are the same God, also there are not three persons that are the same God. That's a contradiction. But we don't have a contradiction, we just have a paradox in the Trinity. There is one God, and three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are that one and same God. All right. Know the role of each person of the Trinity in our salvation. The role of God the Father is that he so loved the world. So he gave, he sent his Son to be our Savior. The role of, so the role of the Father is that of a loving, gracious, forgiving Father. The role of the Son is he's the one who took on human flesh, took humanity upon himself. Remember, he's Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, he lived the life we're supposed to live, a righteous life of obedience to the Father. He died the death that we sinners owe. On the cross, he paid the death of my sin and your sin. Um, and then he rose for our justification. He rose to life, which we're going to need. We need resurrection. And Jesus rose and he's going to raise us too. He ascended into heaven for us. He's coming back for us. That's the work of God, the son, the second person of the Trinity in our salvation. And then the work of the third person of the Trinity in our salvation is that we're saved by grace through faith. And faith creation is the Holy Spirit's job. You and I would not believe in Jesus. We would not believe in God as a loving father if not for the Holy Spirit working through the word in order to create belief in us. So faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Well, we only have the word of Christ because of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who inspired the prophets and the apostles to record the word for us. He's the one who still works through that word today. It's a living and active word in order to create faith in you and I. So the father loves the world, the son lives, dies, and rises for us sinners, and the Holy Spirit creates faith in Jesus inside you and me, that we too can believe and be saved. Um, know the definitions for atheist and agnostic. The atheist says there is no God. The agnostic says one of a few positions, but they're more positions of ignorance. Either I don't know if there's a God, or maybe there's a God, or we can't know if there's a God. That's the strongest statement because that's not just saying I don't know. That's saying it cannot be known, right? And that harder agnostic position might as well be atheism. All right, what are the two main reasons that we learn about the Trinity? One, we don't want to believe in a false God of our own imagination. We want to believe in the true God as he reveals himself in his true word and in his son. And Jesus reveals God as triune. He tells the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So one name shared by three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we study the scriptures, we see the different persons in the Trinity all over the place. So one God, three persons is how God reveals himself. And I want to believe in God as he reveals himself. And then two, um, all the language about salvation in the scripture is triune language. Right? All, all the language about God saving us talks about the work of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. So if we're to not only understand God as he is, but understand how we are saved by God, um, we need to use the same triune language the Bible does. All right. Um, know both the divine attributes and moral attributes of God. So this is in chapter four, just like there was a list of attributes of scripture in chapter two. There's a list of attributes of God in chapter four. 
The divine attributes relate to his whatness or his being. They're words like eternal. God is without reference to time. He just is. No beginning, no end. Words like omnipotent. He has all power. He can do anything he pleases. And that qualifier, anything he pleases, is important. Because, of course, God can't lie. God can't do evil. God can keep every promise. Tell the truth all the time. Be good all the time. Um, he's powerful. He doesn't have the limitations that we have as creatures and as sinners. God has all knowledge, omniscient, omniscire, all knowledge. Um, God is perfectly wise and knowledgeable of all things. Um, and God, <clears throat> finally, is all present. There is nowhere that God is not. Not only is he just there, he's there everywhere. God just is. We teach little kids this when we sing, he's got the whole world in his hands, right? And then the moral attributes of God relate not to his whatness, but to his whoness, his character, um, that God is holy. He is set apart and transcendent. He is perfect in every way. That God is good. He's, al he's always for you and never against you. Um, that God is righteous and just. That whatever ought to be done, God does it. Whatever is right, whatever is fair, God does that and says that all the time. He is just and righteous. He shows no partiality or favoritism, right? That God is merciful, that he wants to spare us the consequences of our sin, that God is um, gracious. He's a gift-giving God, right? So all these kinds of things are the moral attributes of God. Know the difference between beginning and making. Um, we make things that are different than us. Like I, a human being, can out of wood make a statue, a little, a little wooden figurine. All right, or out of paint, I could make a painting if I had any skill. Um, but we beget things that are just like us. I, a human, have begotten children. I have children that me and my wife share um, that are begotten by it. Like we didn't make them, we've begotten them. They are of us and therefore human just like us. What we use this language for is specifically Jesus, right? You and I are made by God. Adam was made from the dirt of the ground. Eve was made from Adam's side. But Jesus wasn't made by God the Father. Jesus is God. He is begotten, eternally begotten of the Father, and therefore God just like his Father. Um, how does Luther define your God? Whatever you fear, love, and trust above all things, what, whatever you give your heart to, that is your God, right? Um, and that should be Yahweh. That should be Jesus, the triune God of the Bible. Um, be familiar with Trinitarian heresies, especially modalism and partialism. Modalism is the false idea that there is one God in one person who shows up in three different modes. Like the same person shows up as father or as son or as spirit. Modalism is clearly wrong. When Jesus is praying, he's not talking to a different mode of himself. When Jesus is praying, he's talking to a different person, his father. Right? Partialism declares each person person of the Trinity to be a different part of the Trinity. So like the Father's one third, the Son is one third, and the Holy Spirit is that final third of God. And no, none of them are part God, right? Each of them are fully the one and same God, the triune God. Um, there were some other hierarchical heresies that make the Spirit or the Son less than the Father, like subordinationism or adoptionism. Um, and then there um the Unitarian heresies are anyone's like modalism that deny the, the three distinct persons, and they just say it's one person of God. All right, moving on to chapter 8, Jesus Christ. Three components of grace. Uh, grace flows from God's unconditional love for his creatures, right? God is just the gift-giving God who loves us and gives us good gifts because he loves us, not because we're so lovable or worthy of them or deserving of them. Gift-giving, gracious is just who God is. He's a loving God. Um, that it comes to us <clears throat> for Christ's sake, right? On account of Christ, because of Christ, through Christ. All of God's promises are yes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ. And then finally, that God's grace comes to us apart from human merit. We don't earn it, deserve it in any way. You don't work for God's gifts or for his love. He just gives them. That's who he is. Uh, know the statement at Chalcedon, how it avoided both Eutychianism and Nestorianism. All right, so the Chalcedonian statement was, and this happened at a council at Chalcedon in four or whatever AD, I can't remember, 400s AD. Um, they were still arguing over the natures of Christ and his one person, and they were rejecting the Eutychian view that combined his two natures into a single nature. So Eutychus said Jesus is God-man, not like true God and true man, but true God-man, 
like a like a hybrid mixing blending of his two natures. He would have spoken of Jesus as having only one nature, a God man nature. Um, and the church went, that is not right. He has a human nature and he has a divine nature. And then Nestorius, Nestorianism, so separated Jesus' natures that it almost sounded like two Jesuses, right? Like we worship Jesus the God, we don't worship Jesus the man. There's just one Jesus and we worship him, he who is both God and man. So the way the church avoided the errors of Eutychianism and Nestorianism was at the Chalcedonian statement, we said, we believe that Jesus is one person with two natures, with no confusion or mixing of the natures, that's against Eutyches false view, and with no dividing or separating of the natures. That's against Nestorius's view. So Jesus is one person of the Trinity with two natures, a fully divine nature and a fully human nature. It is not his natures that act nor a particular nature that we worship. We worship Jesus, who is true God and also true man, who therefore has both natures fully. What is the personal union? It is the mystery that in one person, both a divine nature and a human nature are fully present. And that's the personal union of the human and the divine in Jesus Christ. We don't understand how that works. We just believe it to be God's word. Why is Christ's humanity and divinity significant for our salvation? Um, if he wasn't God, then he doesn't have authority to forgive sins. If he isn't God, his blood can't cover over my sin. But he is God, and he can forgive, and his blood can cover over my sin. His righteousness can count for me. Did Jesus have to be 100% human? Yes. If he isn't human, right, then he can't take my place. He can't live the righteous life that I'm supposed to live, nor could he die the sinner's death that I'm supposed to die, unless he's human just like me. So because he's God, he can forgive. Because he's human, he can be our righteous saving substitute. Know the three offices of Christ. He is our prophet, bringing the word of God to us in a final way. He is our priest covering over our sin in a final way. He is our high priest, um, interceding between God and man. Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. Then he is our king. And theologians have understood, this is the next question, Christ's kingdom in three categories. First of all, he's king over the whole universe. He governs it all because he made it all. That's his kingdom of power. Second of all, he's king over his church. By his law and gospel, he provides for his church. And that's his kingdom of grace. And then thirdly, in which he governs only only Christians in the kingdom of grace, only believers. And then thirdly, his kingdom of glory, which we await for when the Son of Man returns on the last day in all glory with his army of angels to judge the world and call his believers to him and usher in a new heavens and new earth. That's his kingdom of glory. All right. How is um, know and understand the differences between mercy and grace? Mercy is God's sparing nature that he would not have us pay the consequences, final, the final ultimate consequences, death and hell, of our own sin. Um, instead, he would spare us those consequences, um, and that's Jesus' death for us. Grace is God's gift-giving nature, that he's just a gift-giving God, and he loves to give us not only life and breath, but everything. He gives us forgiveness, salvation, he gives you daily bread, and so on. These are God's gracious gifts, especially the gift of the Holy Spirit to make us new. Know the differences between Jesus' state of humiliation and exaltation. Christians understand Jesus' ministry in terms of his humiliation, his setting aside, his divine attributes, even though he still has them, he temporarily chooses not to use them for our sake, right? So Jesus is true God, but he hangs on the cross. Um, Jesus is... Uh, all knowing, but he says, only the Father knows the day of his return. This is Jesus' state of humiliation. His state of exaltation is when he resumes full use of his divine power and privilege in his resurrection and ascension. Know the differences between Christ's active and passive obedience. His active obedience is his living a righteous life under God's law. His passive obedience is his dying a sinner's death, accused by God's law. Even though he's innocent, he takes our accusation and guilt. That's his passive obedience. What's a great acronym for grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. All right, that's unit two. Wait for unit three.